In recent years, many creative industries have been forced to acknowledge their histories of systemic racism and general lack of diversity. From Oscar So White in the movie industry to Grammy So White in the music industry, gatekeepers are being exposed and called out for refusing to give proper representation and appreciation for artists of color in a vastly changing world. However, throughout all of this necessary outrage, there is one industry that seems to get by unscathed, the publishing industry. As disjointed and unjust as the aforementioned industries truly are, perhaps none of them are as out of step as the publishing industry. According to data compiled by the New York Times in 2020, from 1950 to 2018, 89% of American fiction was written by white people. That means that for seven decades, barely less than 10% of published novels have been written by people of color. As the Times mentions, this imbalance starts at the top. The heads of each of the big five publishing houses, Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, Harper Collins, Hachette Book Group, and Macmillan are all white, along with 85% of those who acquire and edit books. But how did we get here? How did this go on for so long unchecked and unknown to the public? And why, even after several articles have been written about this subject, is it still something that most people remain unaware of? It's important to note that the publishing industry was built and has always been run by rich white men. Many of the big five were established by heirs to some of America's wealthiest, most influential fortunes. And until the 1960s, black authors exclusively depended on these white publishers to achieve national recognition. From Langston Hughes to Nella Larson, the most respected and revered authors of the Harlem Renaissance secured lucrative book deals only through connections with white editors, even though their work was hardly considered to be serving black audiences by said editors. Despite the fact that Richard Wright's native son sold over 200,000 copies in three weeks during 1940, five years later, his memoir, Black Boy, was still heavily edited to suit the taste of white middle-class readers. For black authors, there has always been limitations and biases regarding what they could say and do with their own art. However, as the civil rights movement exploded, the big publishing houses of America finally began to feel the pressure. Teachers and school boards in Chicago and New York were demanding school books that recognize the histories and experiences of non-white Americans. And in Washington, New York Representative Adam Clayton Powell Jr. revealed that after conducting careful research, there was only one single black editor leading a series of school books for the nation's children, causing publishers to scramble to recruit more editors of color. Yet despite these attempts to create a more diverse industry, most publishing houses remained overwhelmingly white. The real change, it seemed, was coming from a revolution of black-owned presses launched elsewhere across the country. In Detroit, there was Broadside Press, in Chicago, Third World, and in Baltimore, Black Classic. From these cultural wellsprings came Amari Baraka, Nikki Giovanni, Audre Lorde, and Sonia Sanchez. But without the proper funds to create splashy campaigns and send their authors on publicity tours, these independent presses could not completely compete with their white counterparts, especially when in the early 1970s, a white editor at Doubleday declared, the black thing is over. Enter Toni Morrison. Hired as an editor by Random House, she was heavily responsible for keeping black literature alive within the major publishing arena. In 1974, she published The Black Book, a landmark anthology of black historical documents that Random House claimed they didn't know how to market. The book became a national bestseller. Two years later, Alex Haley's iconic and legendary novel Roots spent 22 weeks on the bestseller list. When neither blockbuster convinced white publishers to acknowledge a burgeoning black market, Morrison continued to fearlessly support upcoming writers such as Gail Jones 
and Tony Cade Bambara, and even edited the autobiography of famed political activist Angela Davis. However, when she left in 1983, Random House's output of black writers severely plummeted. Of 512 books published by the company between 1984 to 1990, only two were written by black authors, including Morrison herself. This dark age of black literature ended in 1992. For the first time, three black American women, Morrison, Alice Walker, and Terry McMillan, appeared on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. Others such as E. Lynn Harris, Zane, and Edward P. Jones followed in their footsteps. Yet the major difference with this particular crop of stars was that almost all of them gained recognition by cultivating their own fan bases or publicity campaigns. When in 1987, Terry McMillan was denied a book tour for her debut novel Mama from publisher Houghton Mifflin, she took it upon herself to write hundreds of letters to bookstores and black organizations, including excerpts and offering to do readings. This masterful orchestration of creating a tightly knit following eventually helped catapult her massive third novel Waiting to Exhale to the top of the bestseller list. The popularity of black literature grew so heavily in the 1990s that by the turn of the century, the major publishing houses were creating separate imprints to accommodate the now lucrative black consumer market. It appeared to be a renaissance in which black literature was finally taken seriously and appreciated in all of its varied glory. Yet everything shifted in the early to mid 2000s as street lit dominated. Epitomized by the 1999 runaway hit, The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier, street lit stories of drug dealers and prostitutes presented itself as a more realistic portrayal of the black experience and its success began to captivate the hungry pockets of major publishing houses. Yet, with such an intense razor-sharp focus on street lit, alternative stories about black life, such as those regarding middle-class characters and concerns, fell to the wayside, along with the editors who had helped get them past the gates. It all came crashing down when sales for street lit eventually tanked themselves, Having placed so much of their attention on trend rather than quality, the major publishing houses decided to squash and slash the multicultural imprints they had once seemed so eager to establish when the profits were rolling in. As long-standing editor Marie Brown puts, black life and black culture are rediscovered every 10 to 15 years. Which leads us to 2022. Things must be much better today, right? Well, yes, and a resounding no. While more literary prizes have been awarded to people of color, and we are constantly aware of new memoirs and cookbooks by black celebrities, the reality is that out of 220 books on the bestseller list in 2020, only 22 were written by a person of color. In truth, authors still heavily rely on white publishers. In truth, authors are still being paid less than their white counterparts. In truth, authors are still being told, we already have our black girl book for the year. While white editors, when presented with the possibility of having more than one young adult writer of color on their roster, still ask, do we need Angie Thomas if we have Jason Reynolds? Interestingly enough, in the wake of the 2020 protests, publishing companies attempted to atone for their decades-long systemic practices. That June, more than a thousand professionals signed up to practice in a day of action to protest the industry's failure to hire and retain a significant amount of Black employees. New imprints, reminiscent of those from the late 1990s and early 2000s, began to prop up, while the search to acquire non-white manuscripts became paramount. The number of interns and staff even grew exponentially. Yet, although these efforts are commendable, are they truly a sign of change or simply a sign of guilt? With all that's happened before, can we be so sure that this awakening will last? 
Well, if the publishing industry desires to stay in business, then this awakening cannot be short-lived. Surveys show that Americans most likely to read books are those who have a bachelor's degree and earn more than $75,000 a year. Yet, the majority of these graduates are no longer white, but black, Asian, or Latinx, and more likely to be women above all. Publishers, unfortunately, have not prepared themselves for this multicultural reality and now must rush to create clear, viable marketplaces for these consumers eager to see stories about those not unlike themselves. What's worse, as books compete with film, music, and the internet, literacy rates have dropped over the past four decades. In the 1980s, more than 60% of the population consumed at least one book throughout the year. By 2017, the numbers dwindled to nearly 50. And with the decline of brick-and-mortar bookstores, publishers have continuously negotiated with larger retailers, resulting in slimmer profit margins while creating an overwhelming desire to absorb and raid smaller presses. With independent booksellers and publishers operating under this monopoly, the future of publishing seems even bleaker. So why, compared to other creative industries, does this not cause outrage? Well, first off, unlike other creative industries, the publishing world has often operated as one of exclusivity. Whereas film and music embrace mass media and advertisements, wanting their products to reach the largest audiences possible, publishing seems particularly resistant to those practices. New books are rarely heard about, new authors are rarely seen on media outlets, and even award ceremonies are broadcasted strictly on C-SPAN without notice or fanfare. With the lack of spotlight and insight given to the general public, interest naturally wanes. Which leads to my second point. As we move deeper into a more visual-obsessed society, the act of reading has largely been discouraged amongst the population. Unlike other prominent countries, America has rarely invested in its literary future. Reading programs in public schools are routinely dropped and discarded. Even arts colleges, which should nurture the future of literature, are among the most expensive in higher education. When you combine the typically low wages that flood the literary profession, one is not surprised that with so little opportunity for change and disruption, the public remains largely unaware of the underhanded goings-on in the publishing world. So what can we do now? Well, moving forward, the only true solution is to support authors of color who are still struggling through this convoluted haze of history and injustice. Support the authors of color under major contracts. Support authors of color publishing on their own. Support editors. Support publicists. Support bookstores. Support small presses. Show the major publishing houses they've been wrong this entire time. Show the major publishing houses that our stories do matter, are important, and above all, truly reflect the multifaceted identity of what it means to be an American. One weeps at the idea of how vastly different fiction in America would have been over the past seven decades without the denial to support and acknowledge the vast voices within this nation. Yet looking forward, we can only blame ourselves if we do not rectify these issues. In 10 to 15 years time, we cannot look back and say, we should have tried harder. If we want change, we must achieve it now. Thank you for watching. For further reading and information, please check out the articles in the info section. Without them, this video could not be done. Keep reading, my friends.